Hello, um, it's a real pleasure to be here at Sciland 13 and to be exhibiting my work and speaking about my project Dark Skies, which is a meditation on darkness and on scale. Uh, my name is Patricia Olinick and I am from uh, the United States, born in Canada. I currently have an academic teaching position at Washington University in St. Louis and I commute back and forth between St. Louis and New York in the United States. At Washington University I am the Florence and Frank Bush Professor of Art and I also have many courtesy appointments in other units at the university because I am usually working uh, collaboratively with scholars and historians and industry specialists and technicians and people who occupy uh, many different uh, intellectual and scholarly territories as well as people from the sciences. So. Uh, the Research University is a perfect context for me to produce my work. I'm here to talk to you today about dark skies and also to tell you a little bit about the, um, the history of my work and where my work is uh, inspired and how I got started a little bit. Uh, so I'm uh, very inspired uh, by the, this ethos of uh, collaboration and unity that came out of the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT. Um, in the 60s, uh, the Center for Advanced Visual Studies was launched by none other than Georgi Kepesh, and uh, this really grew out of a kind of popularization of uh, complexity theory and uh, theories of coexistence, for example, um, cybernetics. Uh, so when all of these ideas became very popularized, uh, art design and architecture, particularly art and design, began to craft objects that really um, heightened the viewer's uh, understanding of their, uh, their presence within the world by way of uh, these kind of heightened sensory experiences. So this is something I think that has really inspired my work. And uh, so Coming from that time, a lot of artists, Otto Pena, Georgi Kepesh, Frank Molina, a lot of artists were, were producing works with light. In fact, a uh, curator from Canada, Nina Shiglady, uh, curated an exhibition, I think about eight or ten years ago, at the Ludwig Museum in Budapest called The Pleasures of Light, and it was an exhibition of the work of Frank Molina and Georgi Kepesh that uh, um, exhibited some of their most uh, iconic light sculptures and light works. So, um, Dark Skies, which is the, the artwork, the large-scale artwork on exhibition at Annenkirch uh, for Silent 13, is a multimedia, multi-sensory, um, large-scale work that is a collaboration with Axiomi in the United States, uh, Sung Ho Kim, and uh, it's a piece whereby I also engage sound designer Christopher Ottinger, and it was also exhibited uh, in a slightly different form at the California Nanosystems Inst Institute at UCLA, and also at the Biobat Art Space at Brooklyn, New York, and uh, it's a work that is inspired by a question that I have about what it means to no longer be able to observe the world around us. I'm very interested in um, in the fact that light pollution, for example, completely obfuscates our view of the night sky. And what does this do to human consciousness when, first of all, we no longer have access to complete darkness, which we need for um, at, the, at the sort of DNA and, and cellular level just to live uh, a healthy life. Um, but what does it do to human consciousness when we can no longer observe the world around us? So the International uh, Dark Skies Association and, and many other scientists and researchers have looked at the, uh, the negative effects of obtrusive light in the world and the effects uh, of this on our living patterns, our circadian rhythms, our feeding patterns, our sleep patterns, what happens to us at the cellular level. 
it's it's a it's a complex uh, set of issues and problems that we have because of this obtrusive light in the world. So, um, so I'll be talking about this work, uh, Dark Skies, and the, what motivated it, which is this, this question, what does it mean uh, for our consciousness and for us biologically when we no longer have access to the, to the night sky. Uh, and so, um, I'll start by showing some images of an exhibition that I had at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. And from that exhibition, uh, you can see that there are both micro and macro images that I took from a transgenic lab uh, at the University of Michigan through a grant from the Office of the Vice Provost for Research. And I began working with visualization techniques such as uh, this one where I'm using a scanning electron micro microscope to visualize microscopic forms that include sites of sensation on human and non-human bodies. So things that we sense with. So th this would be tissue uh, from the eye, it would be nasal epithelial cells, uh, taste buds, which you'll see will play fig very prominently in the night skies piece, um, inner ear cochlea, and then of course uh, a lot of creatures, including human creatures that touch. And there are many more uh, sites of sensation and many more um, ways in which we sense the world and uh, experts in this area say in, in, in uh, proprioception say that there are many other ways in which we sense which include gravity and temperature and barometric pressure but for this project I really just um, was really focusing for the National Academy of Sciences project was just really focusing on five senses and I began to gather the scanning electron micrographs and the one that really interested me the most was a taste bud which you will see uh, come up in the dark skies work later so so let's start by looking at a few night skies and um, this is a night sky from New York City and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very strong visual representation of what happens when we really can't see that far due to obtrusive city light. And aside from the loss of stars from view, uh, studies show that uh, light pollution um, destroys about 7% of smog-eating uh, microorganisms, and uh, so chemicals build up uh, in these light environments, which would otherwise be consumed by uh, biological uh, microorganisms if it was dark. And this leads to a 5% jump in kind of uh, wheeze-inducing ozone uh, pollution during the day. So not having enough darkness and having all this light pollution actually has a very negative uh, impact on our biological system. So, so the Dark Skies piece responds to both our biological and our psychological need for darkness and the disorienting effects of light on human and non-human life forms. And the International Dark Sky Association defines the state of our skies over urban areas as something called photopollution. And uh, it's also called night glow, trespass, light clutter, uh, obtrusive artificial light and energy waste. So aside from, as I said, the obvious psychological impact, there's terrible biological impact uh, for human and non-human life. So in uh, 2014 there was a blackout. Uh, the city uh, grid went down. This is uh, in North uh, America, in East North America, near Toronto. And you can see by these two images that um, the, the city sky, uh, which completely obliterates the, uh, the Milky Way, you can see what the night sky looks like without this city light. And it's really dramatic. And there were people who saw the night sky for the first time because of this blackout. And it's uh, not unlike um, the 
the blackout that happened in 94 in Northridge, uh, which is in Los Angeles, when a 6.7 magnitude earthquake crashed the power grid citywide as well. And these weird cosmic bodies in the sky had people so afraid that they were calling 911. And, uh, and they were also calling the different observatories in the areas, and they were told not to worry that what they were seeing for the first time was just the night sky and the Milky Way. But this is how disconnected humans have become from um, from uh, from the environment and from the night sky due to urban living so um, so you can see the night sky over some of the destruction of the earthquake in 94 um, in Riverside um, and then here is a scale called the Bortle scale. It's a nine uh, level numeric scale that measures uh, night sky brightness. And you can see how all those different levels uh, obliterate the night sky. There are, again, uh, nine of these scales. And here you can see the world map where you see every continent in darkness. So this is shot over a 24 hour period. And you can see the locations of, of, uh, of the world that have most light trespass or light pollution. So my my, my position was to try to create an artwork that somehow heightens your sensation to not only darkness, but to this really incredible cinematic moment uh, on the 24 hour clock, and that is sundown. So what the piece shows is sundown happening over and over again because this is a very heightened moment uh, that we're really familiar with uh, in cinema. You know, a lot of things happen when the sun goes down and particularly in the genre of mystery or noir or even horror, when the sun goes down there's a certain kind of fear or trepidation as darkness comes and nightfall comes. So it's a, it's a moment where humans are often feeling uh, a certain kind of dread but there are also groups and individuals in the world that are forming these groups where they're trying to live in absolute darkness for one week or one month periods. And it's a very disorienting experience at first, but there is a real desire to re reconnect with darkness and an understanding that, that we need to reconnect with darkness. So, um, so this is how the artwork starts. Uh, it reaches back to the archive I collected for the National Academy of Sciences exhibition. And here you're going to see the taste bud of a wild mouse. Why the taste bud of a wild mouse? Well, a wild mouse is a creature that when the sun is going down and nightfall arrives, comes out. So here you have the taste bud of the wild mouse. And um, here, you see an abstracted uh, image of that wild mouse taste bud, and it's uh, an image that was produced uh, through the um, modeling software at Axiomi by Sung Ho Kim. And here you see we further uh, abstracted that taste bud to create this dimensional surface because dark skies exist in two versions. It exists as a dual projection hitting a sculptural wall at a raking angle with a uh, stereoscopic sound installation that goes with the work, uh, kind of spatialized sound uh, scape that goes with the work, and it exists as 2.0, which is what you will see in a, in a few minutes. Uh, you'll see documentation of the work as it exists at Annenkirch for Silent uh, 13. So moving on, you see that we made a lot of different uh, examples of the, um, of the taste bud, the wild mouse taste bud. We're trying to use modeling systems, uh, architectural modeling systems to determine the height and the, the amount of relief that we need on the sculptural wall in order to build uh, a good visual and sound environment. And here you see that we are also doing some testing of where the projectors would be and what the human shadows interrupting that artwork would look like at different, uh, at different um, distances from the surface of the wall and uh, varying based on how deep that wall is, how much of a relief that wall is. 
And here's another uh, sample of that. And here's the wall actually being carved on a CNC router. So this artwork, uh, 1.0, is, uh, is a dual projection on a sculptural wall. And this is a four by eight foot uh, single tile being carved on a CNC router. Um, and this was carved at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. It was the largest work that was CNC routed in our facility there. And in fact, two of the four by eight foot walls fit together to create an eight by eight foot wall. And this is the way the work exists uh, as Dark Skies 1.0. And, uh, and when you're in front of the work, if you interrupt one of, the, um, uh, one of the two projections, you seem to be sort of implicated or drawn into the artwork. You will in fact block, as you block one projection, the inside of your shadow, the shape of your shadow, will reveal only what is being projected from the second projector. So there's this real sense of being implicated or drawn into this interspecies world, and this also creates both a, uh, a kind of an integration, but also a little bit of an perhaps a kind of anxiety because it's an integration into the unknown. So it creates a um, a sense of being one with the sky, one with the world, and uh, and Sung Ho Kim uh, states that while producing the data sets for this digitally routed surface, that he imagined matter made of many particles uh, in constant motion from which the scales of the universe would appear to emerge. And so this work uh, also has a deep psychological effect on the viewer because one cannot really understand one's bodily scale in relationship to what is being viewed. So at times the wall appears to be a microscopic form which renders us the scale of a giant and at other times it seems to almost be an aerial view of the earth which renders us uh, in, a, in, a, in a very far proximity from the surface of something and at other times it appears to be something very large which renders our bodily scale into something that appears to be quite miniature. So, so again, this is the Dark Skies 1.0 with the sculptural wall uh, intact, and here you'll see details of the multi-channel video projection uh, on either raking angle of the piece. So you can see that it's vespertine or sundown sky on one side, and on the other side you can see that it's night sky with this Milky Way kind of waterfall. And the two soundtracks that go with this work uh, are, are something that create a spatialized environment as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and here you will see a video of the Dark Skies work. And this is about three minutes long.
And here we are at Annenkirch, and Annenkirch uh, is where we are displaying Dark Skies 2.0. So my cinematographer and uh, DP, Adam Hogan, uh, photographed, actually videographed the, the uh, Dark Skies piece in my studio a few weeks ago and then created Dark Skies as a mirrored image for the installation at Annenkirch where we projected this 26 feet wide and where we still have the two um, soundtracks playing in stereo in the gallery at Annenkirch and here it is 26 feet wide and you can see the dark skies um, actually the whole dimensional wall has been filmed and incorporated into this so the dark skies work has actually been uh, projected onto this 26 foot wide screen uh, in the stage area of the installation space and it also has been projected onto uh, the architecture at several different sites in Annenkirch. And the sound designer that um, played with my original soundtrack, which was consisted of um, sound recordings that I took at sundown uh, during a residency at the Banff Center for the Arts. So what you hear in the soundtrack are these very eerie, um, sounds of creatures coming out at night. You can't really tell what they are. Some of them sound like very, very small, almost insects. Others sound like larger animals. And so Chris Ottinger did a special sound mix of all of these different elements, but he did a very special sound mixing for the stereoscopic sound, whereby the first soundtrack sonically articulates the ambiguous space between the micro and macro environments, uh, echoing those that are actually depicted in the video. So for the field recordings that I captured, uh, he mixed the small sounds, the sounds of birds and insects, and he actually uh, slowed those smaller creature sounds down so that they would sound very big. And then he took the larger animal sounds and he sped them up. So he's really playing with a kind of confusion of our auditory uh, capabilities so that we are, uh, we are trapped in this kind of sonically ambiguous space when we listen to this soundtrack of Dark Skies. Here is a, uh, another view of the installation at Annenkirch. And here, uh, the terrific curator, Elena Gubanova, uh, also wanted to project uh, dark skies directly onto the architecture at the back of the exhibition main hall space so that the walls, the architecture itself, seem to be coming alive. So here you have the dark skies uh, scaled down, and on the other end of the Great Hall, you have, um, you have the piece uh, uh, blown up very large. So what's interesting about the piece, the last uh, point that I'd like to make, is that the only way that you could see the night sky and the sundown, which are two distinctly different points in the 24-hour clock, the only way you can see this simultaneously is by way of technology. So the only way the way this work can be, uh, can exist in the way that it does is by way of technology. So, so this is also a testimony to the way that we reimagine the environment around us and the way that we reimagine the way that we occupy the environment around us by way of technology. So that is, um, that is my uh, lecture on dark skies and um, thank you.